Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Astro President Geraldine Jacobson. Uh, thank you. So, um, thank you, everyone. And we're just about to enter the fourth and final session of the Presidential Symposium. This session, Human Doctors, Human Patients, will focus on aspects of emotional intelligence related to patient care. And we have a great set of speakers and topics. So I'd like to present our first speaker, Dr. Rachel Rabinovich, who is a faculty member at the University of Colorado. So welcome, Dr. Rabinovich. I want to thank Dr. Jacobson for inviting me to participate in this symposium. It's intimidating to speak to a room of oncologists and think that I have something new to tell you about doctoring. My thoughts today are not comprehensive. I'm sure there are many of you in this room who've been treated for cancer yourselves that could give this presentation with completely different material. Each cancer story is unique, like the individual. I'm simply sharing thoughts based on my own personal experience of being a clinician and a cancer patient. I was diagnosed at the age of 41, married with three children. It's worthwhile for you to know that my areas of expertise are breast cancer and lymphoma. And yes, I can assure you that there is a relationship between areas of disease site expertise and malignancy developed. For any resident in the room who's interested in a project with a guaranteed p-value of zero, less than 0 0.05, I invite you to follow up on this. Cancer is a great lesson, and you are not in control. I had the benefit of being able to handpick my medical oncologist and surgical oncologist after 10 years of working with a group of colleagues in a comprehensive cancer center. I turned over my need to control to them as I had trust in their medical care, experience, and communication skills, and I like them as people. Your patients don't have that advantage. They get the doctor with the open consult slot, or you're the doctor that their doctor referred them to. How can they really trust you? How can they know that they are in control when they really don't have control? Sometimes your difficult patient is just struggling with the issue of control. It's okay, it's okay to acknowledge how hard that can be. Be understanding of your patient's loss of control and how that might be playing out in your clinic. We're all educated to, treat our, to inform our cancer patients about acute and late toxicities, yet we rarely describe what happens during therapy. When I arrived for my first adriamycin and cytoxan cycle, I wasn't prepared for the drama of the nurse sitting down in front of me with a 60 cc syringe of this hot pink fluid that she was ready to do a slow push into my IV. I was petrified of what was going to happen when that fluid started flowing through my veins. I needed someone to tell me, you're going to feel nothing. I now tell every patient, you're not going to feel anything when the radiation beam is on, and you're going to walk out of the treatment room as if nothing happened. I expect my patients, my residents, to do the same. And even if your patient doesn't say this, when they're lying on that treatment table before the very first fraction, they're nervous and anxious and they need you to tell them. It's difficult to appreciate the nuance of, nuances of an experience until you have lived it yourself. While I consider myself a relatively compassionate, insightful people person, I was surprised by many things I didn't appreciate until I went through them myself. My doctoring really hasn't dramatically changed. Subtle shifts, and I hear things a little bit differently. A simple example relates to seeing my follow-up patients. I would routinely ask them about toxicities of therapy. Are they having any hot flashes? I spent a lot of time managing hot flashes and was very comfortable with the rubric of management. But what did I know? I was a 41-year-old premenopausal female. I didn't take this problem too seriously. So after my first cycle of chemotherapy, I began to have these intense episodes of sweating, and I felt like someone had lit a heat lamp inside my head. These were extraordinarily uncomfortable, and I had to leave several meetings and social events 
for the cool breeze outside the room. And it's funny, in retrospect, I really had no idea what was happening. And one day in my kitchen, it occurred to me, oh, that was a hot flash. It suddenly stuck. And now I think of hot flashes on a much more serious level when I deal with my patients in clinic. After I finished a lumpectomy, sentinel lymph node biopsy, dose dense ACT, and whole breast radiation therapy, life was supposed to go back to normal. But I began to, began to have trouble sleeping. I was plagued with the question, did all this really work? Your patients have the same question. They don't know, and you don't know. There is comfort for some of us in the difficult, time-consuming treatments, and it can be frightening to stop. I was reminded that ovarian suppression and oral tamoxifen were very powerful yet easy treatments, and that was helpful. So now I inform my patients on the last week check visit to be prepared that it's possible they may notice an increase in anxiety. And if it lasts for more than six weeks, they should call me and I can offer them some additional help. While it sounds cliche, we should all bring more than just evidence-based medicine into clinic. Bring your best qualities to your doctoring. Every patient wants to feel that they know you and that you understand who they are and that you have their back. And no, there are no RVUs associated with that type of work. At my routine annual exam, at my routine annual mammogram five years after diagnosis, the tech called me back for additional views, which I was used to. They were always fascinated with the lumpectomy bed. And as I pivoted my body to that side, the tech said, no, your other side. I was confused. During the ultrasound that followed, I could easily appreciate the hypoechoic antiparallel mass with posterior shadowing, and I knew what I was looking at. Laura, my colleague and breast radiologist, also knew that I knew. She paused and said, do you want me to get Ginger into the room? She's my medical oncologist who had just finished examining me just an hour before. Doing this slowed down both Laura and Ginger's day, but Ginger came in and held my hand during that breast biopsy. Their combined compassion and kindness were immeasurable to me. Be a little bit like Laura and Ginger. After receiving a cancer diagnosis, there are a host of conversations that we have to deal with, a whole variety of decisions that no one prepares you for. I knew what that biopsy would show. I cried in the car the entire way home. I didn't want to worry my husband about the inevitable diagnosis until I had that pathology report in hand. That evening, he asked me why my eyes are red. He's an allergist. I told him it was hay fever. It was December in Colorado. Somehow that answer worked. <laughs> I was in anguish thinking of how to tell my kids who finally felt safe that we were about to go through this all over again. I anticipated seeing the worry in my friends' faces, which was an added burden. I didn't want to tell my overly dramatic mother about this diagnosis and deal with her response. Perhaps you think I shouldn't have been worrying about all these people, but I suspect many of your patients do. I am blessed with a husband who has always been by my side and a wonderful community, work environment, and economic stability. But many of your patients don't have the benefit of those resources. Know that your patients have a lot to manage outside of their direct cancer care. I handled my first diagnosis pretty well emotionally, but after my second diagnosis, the bottom fell out. An MRI demonstrated multicentric disease on the contralateral side. How could I have developed breast cancer again only four years after dose-dense ACT, ovarian suppression, while on adjuvant tamoxifen? At the age of 46, I was just beginning to feel my legs again. My recurring thought was, what is left to do? I felt doomed and out of options. I had days of complete and utter panic. I couldn't focus or concentrate. I prayed that God should just help me live long enough to see my kids through high school. My therapist, Stacy, who I adore and declined to be photographed for this slide, was an absolute lifesaver for me. You don't need to have cancer to benefit from a therapist, but cancer is a great reason to see one. Be sure to remind your patients of mental health resources at the start of their cancer journey and at every follow-up visit. Ensure that your patients are doing well during survivorship, both medically and emotionally. At this point, staging studies were ordered for the first time, CT scan, chest, abdomen, and pelvis, and bone scan. 
the nuclear medicine tech, who didn't know me, went through his usual spiel. We'll take standard pictures, and if the doctor has any concerns, she'll take a few additional images. He returned 10 minutes later and said, the doctor wants to take additional views of, of your lumbar spine. Please go into the bathroom, empty your bladder, and came back. I went into the bathroom and started sobbing. I knew I had metastases in my lumbar spine. In the end, the radiologist came out and explained to me that because of my lumbar lordosis, it had affected the image quality in my lumbar spine, and so she had to take additional views. But I didn't know that, and no one had explained that to me. Patients make intelligent but incorrect decisions based on what you say and what you don't say. So try to be as clear as you can and anticipate their interpretations. We doctors are very MD-centric. We forget that the patient experience may be more impacted by others on your team than you. Nurses, therapists, medical assistants, front desk staff, people they interact with more than you. After my bilateral mastectomy and deep flap, my surgeon visited me for less than two minutes on most days. I was moved by Marta, who helped me bathe when I had three drains and full swollen wooden legs that didn't seem to work. Candy, my day shift nurse and biggest cheerleader, came into my room at 7.30 a.m. on post-op day two and excitedly announced, Rachel, today you're gonna take a walk down the hall and have a bowel movement. My day's accomplishments were reduced to the most banal, banal activities, but she made them seem as dignified and important as submitting an abstract to this meeting. To this day, I have a list of names of the nurses and MAs who cared for me during that hospital stay when I was the most physically vulnerable. They cared for me with warmth, compassion, and respect. The unexpected happens all the time in medicine, and yet we always seem to be surprised. One month after, under, after undergoing the mastectomy and deep flap, I developed an itchy cough and lost my voice. When it didn't recover after 10 days, I was diagnosed with bilateral vocal cord granulomas. It turns out that 10 hours of irritation of an ET tube on the vocal cords can cause this. I couldn't speak for four months, even while in clinic. No one had mentioned this side effect to me, and I don't blame the anesthesiologist, I don't think it's too common, but it did lead me to consider why don't anesthesiologists see patients and consult before surgery? And why don't they see follow-ups? And how do we handle unusual, unexpected toxicities? Similarly, patients know when they have an unusual presentation. My second cancer had an oncotype of 31, 32 actually, indicating the need for chemotherapy. Yet it had developed within four years of dose-dense ACT, the most aggressive regimen for my type of breast cancer. I was appreciative of my medical oncologist Ginger's explanation that this was an unusual scenario and that she went to consult with several colleagues of hers across the country. I was incredibly relieved when they all unanimously returned with a recommendation for adjuvant CMF. We shouldn't be afraid to tell our patients that their disease exists in a data-free zone and that we will consult with others for a consensus, especially those of us with big egos or reputations. In oncology, overall survival is still the gold standard endpoint. At an NCCN lymphoma conference, I presented the data from a trial demonstrating a double-digit disease-free survival benefit from adjuvant therapy at 10 years following definitive radiation therapy for early-stage follicular lymphoma. A nationally recognized medical oncologist at the table said, I'd much rather give chemotherapy when the patient relapses since there's no survival benefit. The other medical oncologists started to nod their head in unison. I was stunned. Did none of them consider that people don't want to live with cancer? Would they prefer to live with cancer even if the overall survival benefit isn't any different? I view study outcomes differently now than I used to. Patients may not give you a physical gift, but when they thank you with words, that is their gift to you. I used to respond to expressions of thanks with a glib, airy, oh, it's nothing, that's my job. But I think that that trivializes the depth of what they are trying to express to you. I now say thank you, your words are very meaningful to me. And a last thought, when speaking to fellow oncologists with cancer, many of us have a unique experience given our background and training. 
It was difficult for me to find people that I felt understood what I was going through. I felt alone. My patients didn't have the information and experiences that I had. I saw patients who relapsed with incurable cancer all the time, and my colleagues didn't really, really understand what I was going through. I suspect there is a need for a resource, one that does not yet exist, to serve the oncologist cancer patient. So if any of you in the audience or anyone you know are an oncologist who have or have been treated for cancer and find this interesting, please reach out to me and let me know. I'm thrilled to tell you that I celebrated my 58th birthday last week and remained cancer free. On behalf of the cancer patient community, I want to thank each of you for your compassionate, attentive care that you give us each and every day. And may we all rise to be the best caregivers that we can be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to invite Dr. Sage Bolte from Innova Health System as our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. It's a hard act to follow. Thank you for sharing your story. It's great to be here. Um, for those of you who know me, I am not known for my brevity, and I am taking about a two-hour lecture and putting in a, about 12 minutes. So um, these are going to be broad and general. Um, information related to sexual health. Unfortunately, I won't be able to do deep dives into the LGBTQ issues, but you can always pull me aside later. And I'm happy to have a conversation. And just a warning, I am pretty casual in the conversations around sexual health, so you might find yourself shifting in your seat, maybe a little uncomfortable at times. Just notice it, ride with it. We'll be in this together. Before we talk about the impact cancer and its treatments have on sexual health, I think it's really important just to see the framework for how I think about and teach on the topic of sexuality and intimacy. So I wanted to share with you my conceptual model. I'm gonna use the story of Judy to walk you through it in a moment. We all have multiple selves, right? From the cognitive behavioral theory model, um, we have selves that make us up. Our professional self is different than our parent self sometimes. Our survivor self might be different. And religious, cultural, family traumas influence much of the making of ourselves and our sexual self is how we think about our sexuality and sexual expression, and how that influences our feelings, which then influence the sexual and non-sexual behaviors we do or do not engage in. So if we think about Judy, prior to Judy's breast cancer diagnosis, she had struggled with low self-esteem. and She'd had low body image, and the birth of her children further exacerbated this. After a lumpectomy and radiation, she couldn't look at her body anymore. In fact, she kept the lights off in the bathroom and was constantly protecting herself from being seen by her partner. She didn't want to be touched. She had the thought and belief that she was deformed. I'll never be desirable. I'll never feel sexual again. These added to her feelings of depression and the behaviors of further withdrawing from her partner and leading them to have marital discord. We have the great privilege as care providers to help our patients improve their sexual self, even if this is as simple as a recognition of the problem normalization and referral to a trusted partner. You're all aware of the many ways cancer and its treatments influ influence the biopsychosocial issues that our patients have, all of which many of our patients experience and many who have no idea that a medication they are taking, for example, could possibly complicate the problem they're already experiencing or that a simple change in medication or sexual position could help alleviate the problem. Cancer and its treatments can impact the four phases of sexual response, and it's important to know where our patients are being affected so we can better show up for them and help them find solutions. If their problem is low desire or erectile dysfunction caused by fatigue, or maybe not finding themselves attractive or their partner attractive, like in the case of Judy, we can help prescribe solutions that focus on that rather than just handing them a prescription for Viagra. There are significant psychological impacts as well. We know that grief and loss are a tremendous challenge that our patients face, which further exacerbate the way they view their sexual body and their interest or eagerness to resume their sexual life. But resuming sexual function, even if it looks different than it did prior to cancer, is one way that many patients say, my life is finally getting back to normal again. And although we've definitely improved our screening of potential fertility loss, and we've started talking more about sexual health with our patients, we still have a long way to go to assess sexual health and provide some basic information to all of our patients, regardless of age, 
relationship status, and sexual orientation, and regardless of whether they have cancer of a sex organ or not. It's important to note that sexual dysfunction and changes in intimate relationships continues to be identified in the top 10 quality of life issues survivors report and show up long after treatment is completed. We've certainly improved providing information to patients, again, who have cancer of a sex organ, but all cancer treatments, regardless of diagnosis, can have some to significant impact on the sexual self and sexual function. And the cancers listed here have significant data documented to show ongoing challenges in sexual function and sexual distress. So if we know this is an issue of quality of life, but I don't have to keep repeating it or showing you data, why aren't we talking about it? We know this is an issue and the data supports that there is distress to our patients. So what gets in our way? I specifically use the word perceived barriers because oftentimes the barriers identified can be worked around, but our own internal and external barriers get in our way. So this is an opportunity for us to be introspective and pause. What gets in your way? Is it the fear of making a patient uncomfortable? Maybe you're worried you won't have the right answer or all the answers. Maybe you believe one of your colleagues in, uh, in the medical oncology department is addressing it. Maybe you believe if the patient is a different gender that they don't want to hear it from you or they'd be uncomfortable. And a real barrier, but one we have to figure out how to overcome is the barrier of time. If the patient told you they were nauseous, you would take the time to address it. And for the patient, they're worried about embarrassing you. They're worried about making you uncomfortable, so they're not going to bring it up. In fact, study after study shows that they're waiting for you to initiate the conversation. They may not feel safe to initiate these concerns if your office is very heteronormative or doesn't show diversity. If your office doesn't have materials that continue to allow conversations and show that you are a provider that is open to all genders, all orientations. They also may believe, sadly, and this is probably the one that makes me the saddest, that there's just nothing that you can do and it's just a side effect they're gonna have to live with forever. So the explicit model, there are lots of models that are um, able to be used, and I'm gonna talk about the explicit model in a minute, but just as psychosocial assessments are a continuous part of the patient's care, hopefully, sexual assessments should be part of that as well. We want to understand all aspects of our patient's lives, such as food insecurity, transportation challenges, relationship struggles, and challenges or changes to sexual function or sexual distress because these can both be barriers to adhering to treatment, but also better, barriers to better quality of life. To put it blunt, bluntly, how many of you would be okay with never feeling sexual pleasure again? Would you just be happy to be alive? Because that's what a lot of our patients hear from us. The easiest and most proficient way to introduce screening is just to keep it part of the current psychosocial or health screenings that you do. At a simple Likert scale, create a question that you make part of your assessments. Just think if we do that, the impact that it would have on stigma or an easing discomfort in bringing the information forward. I know as a sex therapist, when I walk into a group room or treatment room, patients would always um, say, hey, that's the sex lady. But what, although there was a little laughter and giggle with it, what it also did was reassure that we at ANOVA care about that aspect of their quality of life and aren't afraid to talk about it, not just in a private room. The explicit model is just a model that is to reinforce giving permission at every encounter, every engagement you have with the patient to be a sexual being or to ask about sexual issues, permission to discuss that, giving limited information like flyers in your new patient folder or maybe printing them out as, as you're done with them in their assessment. Assessment tools are great, but nothing replaces a conversation. As you open the door for these discussions, the patient may say, well, that's not really an area I'm concerned with, or I'm not worried about that right now, or everything's fine. But I can promise you that when you open that door and something does show up for them, because it will according to statistics, you will be the very first person that comes to mind and they will reach out to you. In addition to a Likert scale in your distress screening or other health screening, think about ways you could give permission for the patient to discuss sexual health concerns with you, but also permission to be a sexual being in the midst of and after treatment. And that although they may look different, their recovery or the challenges they face may look different during different phases of treatment 
or in survivorship, you recognize that sexual health and intimate relationships are an important part of quality of life. What might it look like if upon meeting your patients to outline their treatment protocols, you said something like, we really value all aspects of quality of life. Radiation to the neck may impact your saliva production, and this is a common side effect that we can work with you to treat. You might notice that this impacts your intimate relationships with things such as kissing, and I want you to know that we can help come up with some creative solutions for that as well. One suggestion would be to use salgin prior to kissing, or you could simply try sucking on a lifesaver or mild mint. And if you notice that you're having increased challenges or distress about some of the side effects, I want to be sure we discuss them to find solutions or to connect you to one of my colleagues who can help you find solutions. That is permission and limited information and takes 25 seconds. Many of these side effects you would refer to a professional to manage. However, knowing that most of the common concerns, if you know them, it allows you to be a provider to be proactive and again address them early and often by normalizing and giving permission. And understanding, for example, that for a gay man with colorectal or prostate cancer, the long-term impact of erectile function is truly life-altering, life-altering for him and his partner. Knowing at a high level how to treat these is also important, as you you all may be the only person they are willing to see or discuss these challenges with. The number one complaint by both men and women is when changes in libido occur, often because of hormones, and when sexual function is impacted. Importantly, letting patients know the most important sex organ is the mind, and the skin is the largest sex organ. That can reinforce truly there are limitless possibilities to improve sexual pleasure in addressing these common concerns. Keeping in mind that for our younger patients who are thrust into a world where they might not have had many sexual experiences yet, or they may not understand what the impact of menopause is, this can create even greater distress. I mean, managing the impact of aging and dating is hard enough. So anything we can do to minimize the distress these patients feel is an opportunity. Education and information is so important. First, it's important to address this for all women, gay, straight, by whether they're having penetrative intercourse or not, a strong and healthy vagina is important. So treating vaginal and vulvar health is critical. Whether a woman is treated for radiation in her pelvic floor or not, dilator therapy can be incredibly beneficial to all women, especially to women who are thrust into medically induced menopause. The dilators, unfortunately, we give in our radiation oncology department, I find they're very awkward, they're hard, they're often large, they're cold, they're impersonal. So if you have the option to have more variety of size to make them less scary um, and or encourage them or maybe you purchase some kits from uh, like an organization like vaginismus.com that are more malleable and just more friendly in nature, that might be an option. Using dilators to stretch and strengthen with Kegel exercises and moisturizing is the one tip I give every woman regardless of the type of cancer or treatment. Since many, many people experience changes in the frequency of sexual intercourse during their cancer treatment, it becomes all the more increasingly important that they know that they need to be proactive on keeping that pelvic floor muscle strong. So when they do engage in intercourse or have a gynecological exam, it's not painful. Or frankly, as many of the women say, when they cough and sneeze, they don't also have urinary incontinence. So certainly there are opportunities to refer to a pelvic floor therapist or refer to one of your trusted network for ongoing care of the vulvar and vaginal health. What you see in front of you are some recommendations that I make as a sex therapist. Again, the best gift you can provide any one of your patients is to provide permission and limited information early and often. If you know a patient is on medications to manage a mood disorder, hypertension, or pain, it's important to ensure that they understand that those medications can exacerbate changes and challenges to their sexual function. And you can partner with their specialist or their primary care physician to help manage these. Many of these changes are also changes experienced when we age and may be accelerated by the cancer treatment. So if a woman is complaining that she has no desire, which is something I hear often, I have no desire, I often will help reframe it. So you're telling me you have no desire, but you have desire to have desire, right? Right then what that tells me is actually you just have low desire, and we can work with low desire. That's very different than no desire. For both men and women, normalizing that there are many ways to experience pleasure and that those experiences may need to change and adapt depending on the day 
and how they're feeling is important. There are resources through the American Cancer Society, like Sex and the Man with Cancer and His Partner, or Sex and the Woman with His Cancer and Her Partner that can address this. And maybe the social worker you work with has a good bibliotherapy list you could offer your patients. Sexual dysfunction for men in this country has boiled down to the prescription of a tiny blue miracle pill. In fact, this pill, if you didn't know it, can also make little teeny tiny Fiat's big cars. Who knew? And although the PDE5 inhibitors are tools and resources that are really great, it has allowed for the belief that a medication can fix everything. It is critical when discussing sexual function with men to understand what else is going on in their life. What was their erection or sexual function like before their cancer diagnosis? What do they expect the medication will assist them with? And almost equally important, does their partner have an equal interest in improving this? If depression or challenges in the partnership exist, the pill will not be a solution for that. And finally, empowering men to find other ways of pleasure and that orgasm is not, believe it or not, the only or ultimate sign of satisfaction is also important. Pelvic floor therapy is also just as important for men and getting them to um, be comfortable with or asking about the use of penile pumps or injections to enhance their erectile function is another tool. So what can you do? Stay self-aware. Notice where you're uncomfortable and lean in. Work on it. Practice talking about it with your colleagues. I know during one of my um, training sessions, we actually had to um, say all the words we were uncomfortable and we had to say them for about an hour. And it took some time and then it just got really easy. Have a broad understanding of the cultural, religious, uh, or regional values around you that might influence how you approach this topic. Ask. Just come up with a question that allows you to ask and or normalize. Make this part of your regular sexual or re your regular health routine, your routine assessment of patients that you ask on a regular cadence. And build a referral network. There are great people out there that can help support you in the work that you do. Now, lucky for you, I am not going to make you turn to one another and say your sexual health matters, but I hope that you have heard this is a critical area of a person's quality of life and cancer doesn't make it less important and you all have the great privilege and opportunity to provide permission and limited information that could truly change a person's sense of hope. There are resources shared here um, that can support you in your work. Discussing sexual health early and often with the use of questionnaires as well as your own curiosity and normalizing these issues with your patients will go a very long way. A diagnosis and treatment of sexual dysfunction must assess the biopsychosocial and inform both the conversations you have but the referrals you make. And maybe most importantly, know that your presence and a conversation about sexual health can be incredibly therapeutic for a patient. Many times all they need to know is this is normal and there are solutions. So how can you start thinking about how you incorporate permission into your practice today? Thanks so much. I now have the privilege to introduce Dr. Sarah Hoff from H. Lee Moffitt Cancer Center and Research Institute. Well, good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of our group, I first want to thank Dr. Jacobson and the organizers for the opportunity to be with you today. So as we begin, we're going to talk about first the emotional intelligence model and digital empathy. Then we're going to talk about some cognitive bias. And we're going to talk about it through the medium of three role plays, which hopefully you'll find very interactive and innovative. And then Ben Korn is going to take us home with a talk about hope theory. Our takeaways, hopefully, from today's session, we are hoping that you'll be able to apply the competencies in the emotional intelligence model so that you can recognize some of these cognitive biases and hopefully have more empathy for both patients and colleagues as you manage these relationships. This is my disclosure. So as we begin today, I'm going to ask everyone to shift their frame of reference and think about patient experience and emotional intelligence. And I'm going to ask you to think about every time you walk into a room with a patient, whether it's a brand new consultation or whether it's a follow-up visit. How do you manage your emotions? How do you become aware of the emotions of your patient and the caregiver? How do you, man how do you manage seeing a scenario on the right versus the left? And how do you go about doing that? Well, one of the things that can help us 
is if we use the frame of the emotional intelligence model. So as you see here, as you think through the model, you're thinking self versus other. And within the self versus other quadrants, you're thinking of awareness and management. So if you looked at the example on the left, you see a very self-assured position. He's about to have a meeting. He's keeping his emotions in check and managing himself very well. Yet, when his colleague comes into the room, as you see here, it changes. Notice his body language. His body language shifts. He becomes dismissive. He becomes avoidant. And everyone in the room can imagine this is not going to be a productive conversation. So when we think about the emotional intelligence model, we think about 12 competencies that are within the model. Today, we're going to focus on two. We're going to focus on the other category, and we're going to focus on empathy under social awareness, and we're going to focus on relationship management. And the reason we're doing that is we're going to talk today about some cognitive biases. These cognitive biases can cause conflict, not only with our colleagues, but also with patients. And this is important when we think about relationship management, because our patients are asked to think about it. If you stop for a moment and think about Press Ganey and what Press Ganey asks our patients, Press Ganey is asking them how much concern we show for them, how our explanations are, how much do we involve them in decision making, and in general, how confident is the patient in us as providers. So, and as we think here today, and we've heard a lot of wonderful talks today, and we are now in this digital age, how do we make the best digital impression? What is our website manner? You start thinking about how are you going to uh, manage yourself on camera? Where do you position your webcam? What's your frame of view? Are you just a talking head? Or are they able to see your body? Does the patient feel connected to you? They've never met you before. It's a telemedicine first consultation. How do you portray that digital empathy through the, through the webcam? How do you modulate your voice so that the patient can process what you're saying? And how particularly are you aware of your body language and how do you manage yourself? And then I would also ask you to think about today empathy opportunities. What happens when a patient on a telemedicine visit expresses a negative emotion. Do we take that opportunity and do we offer back a continuer, which studies have shown is associated for our patients with less anxiety, less depression, greater satisfaction, greater adherence to therapy? Do we say something like, I'm sorry that this must be so scary for you and your caregivers facing this new diagnosis. Do we say something like that, connecting with them on an empathy level? or do we just do a terminator statement? So I would ask us to think through that today and think through that as you're hearing some of these cognitive bias scenarios and start thinking about how you would manage these relationships in your own practice. So at this point in time, we're gonna shift to hopefully what you'll find very interesting and innovative. We're gonna start with the role plays. And to get us started, I'm gonna ask my colleagues to come to the stage and take a seat. So Dr. Ron Ennis, Dr. Neha Vapawala, Dr. Ben Korn, and there's also a very special guest today named Sarah Krug. She's the CEO of Cancer 101. You'll be meeting her a bit later. Now at this point, I just want to remind everybody, we're going to be using audience response for this session. So if you please, if you don't know how to do it, use the QR code and get into it so that you can do that, or you can access it through the app. So please go ahead and do that. And then also make sure you familiarize yourself with how to get the response and how to submit it. As you can see here, there's three simple steps, so you can go ahead and submit. And what we're gonna do in terms of housekeeping is before we do each role play, we're gonna ask you a question. So we're gonna ask you to define one of these biases, then we're gonna do the role play, then we're gonna go over what the answer is and also how we think through it. So let's begin with the first case. Attitude heuristic bias is A, an approach to problem solving that involves having a neutral position on the issue, B, a strategy of having a critical view of any new idea so as not to be easily persuaded, or C, a tendency to allow prior impressions to influence a new decision. 
So please go ahead and start that process and start thinking about that. I'm going to now leave the stage. I'm going to ask Ron Ennis to come up to the podium, and you're going to hear about the first case, which takes place in a consultation room. Good afternoon, friends. How's everyone doing? Please uh, start voting uh, on this, uh, what you think the correct definition of an attitude heuristic is. And we will come back to uh, the, the correct answer and, and what it all means in a few moments. But first, please focus on our astro actors as we see a doctor uh, patient visit discussing treatment decisions. Okay. Doctor, tell me more about this new radiation. Yeah, sure thing. So the plan is that we're going to use precise MRI guidance so that we can really track your tumor while you're breathing. And so that would be the idea behind our treatment plan. Can you hear me? Fred, that's not safe. Don't you remember what happened to Tony? He had radiation to his lungs and look how he turned out. He got so much radiation that his lungs don't work right. He can't breathe on his own. Now he just sits at home doesn't play golf, doesn't go to lunch with his friends. It's just him and his oxygen machine. Doctor, I forgot to tell you my sister would be joining by phone. Uh, Laura, I knew your father-in-law had health problems, but now he just sits at home. That sounds miserable. I don't want to be miserable. Listen, Mr. Myers, that's really unlikely in your case. I mean, for starters, your tumor's quite small. Laura, when was he treated? Did he get the new treatment, too? Uh, no, he got more than a month of radiation. You know, thinking back, I think it was about 10 years ago. Look, Mr. Myers, I am really sorry to hear about your family member, but I really want to make today focused on you, and I'd really like for both of you to be able to hear what we have to say and be able to make a better decision. Doc, I'll try, but to be honest, I can't stop thinking about Tony. I, I'd do anything not to end up like him. Quality of life is the most important thing to me. Okay, excellent. All right, nominate them for an Emmy. Okay, so do we have the <laughs> results? Do we have results? Ah. Excellent, you're right. <laughs> so that's wonderful. So 71% of you got it right. Uh, choice C is the correct uh, answer. So just, just a moment. So cognitive psychology in the last uh, several decades has identified a number of heuristics and biases um, which are automatic human processes that we all do all the time that influence our decision making, sometimes not for the better. Um, and this is a demonstration of an attitude heuristic where Laura, because of prior experience, has a negative attitude towards radiation that is not able to be overcome through this. The point of understanding that this is a bias really helps you deal with it in that you don't just think, oh, the patient is difficult or dumb or something like that, but it's like, oh, she's doing what I do also all the time. And we'll talk a little bit later about some strategies for overcoming that. But I also want you to not just, hopefully it resonated with you that you've experienced this as a physician, but I also want you to be thinking about when do I do this? When do I read literature or interact with colleagues? Or when do my colleagues do this? When this is what's actually happening? And then how do I deal with that? Well, again, we'll talk about it later. It's my pleasure to introduce the voice behind the screen, Ms. Sarah Krug, who is a patient advocate and CEO of Cancer uh, 101. Sarah, so what are your thoughts about uh, how that patient-physician interaction went? So obviously, um, Laura's concerns were dismissed. Um, the doctor didn't necessarily show empathy. Uh, and oftentimes, patients are thrust into the sphere of the unknown, um, where they grasp onto the experiences of others or the stories of others to help gain some of that control. Um, and we often underestimate the impact that um, impressions, prior impressions, can have on a patient's decision making. And so we've run a series of studies around the impact of first impressions on the way in which we act, the way in which we uh, make decisions. And I can tell you that uh, many patients do rely on the stories and the experiences of others as they're engaging in decision making and potentially navigating next steps. I agree. I think, you know, one of the things that often happens as care providers, we're often incredibly pressed for time. 
we're trying to convey a lot of complex information in that limited period of time. Then you throw in an unexpected patient uh, family member on the phone, and uh, you know perhaps you might be tempted to just sort of, okay, refocus, let's get back to what matters, which is you. Um, and perhaps the intentions are the best, but in reality, this was such a missed opportunity because not only would that have been an incredible investment in time, just taking a few minutes to acknowledge the family member on the phone, to acknowledge that I hear you, I'm listening to what your concerns are, and I respect that. I think that only can just set the stage for the patient and the family member being more receptive to what you have to say, right? It's about establishing that, that self-respect. And if, if you've already given the impression that you're not listening and you don't hear what matters to them, how on earth are they going to absorb all the you know, specific data that you're about to share? So I think there were that missed opportunity for the digital empathy and the in-person empathy only, I think, will make the rest of the consultation that much harder. And then just in terms of closing the loop on the cognitive aspects of it, so you've, if you've done well at addressing them and making them feel heard, you still need a technique to be able to share with them what's going on cognitively. And, and, and one of the approaches is something called metacognition, which is an approach where you or you help encourage the patient or family member to step out of themselves and, and recognize what bias might be happening and how someone who had never experienced another family member with this condition might have interpreted the whole conversation very differently. Sometimes, but not always, that can be effective at dealing with this inherent bias. Okay, so we're gonna move on to case two. Um, and for that, we have a, a new question for you. Uh, this is confirmation bias is, A, a tendency to agree with an opinion that others around you have confirmed. B, a belief that one should not accept results of a clinical study unless they have been confirmed or C, a tendency to interpret ambiguous results as supporting one's previously held position. Now call on Dr. Vapiwala, we'll take us through the next session. All right, thanks Ron. So the second role play, we're going to be visiting um, a patient who has decided to follow up after a consultation and she wants to talk to her physician about what she's decided to do for treatment. So let's listen in. Hi, how are you? How have you been? Good to see you. Good to see you as well. Were you able to look at those studies I gave you? Yes, they were very clear. Thank you so much. So does that mean you've made up your mind? Uh, you know how I want to treat your breast, how you want me to treat your breast cancer? Yes, I've definitely made a decision. Great. So Catherine, I, I didn't know you decided. So Harold, you remember we talked to Justine about the first study. Don't you remember what she said about what uh, she sees in her plastic surgery practice? All those complications, you mean? Yeah, I remember that. Well, I would be at a higher risk of a complication, too, based on the first study with that shorter treatment time. And I just don't want that. OK, but I, you know, I just want you to remember, though, that the study that showed the higher complication rate, that was the smaller study, but the much bigger study and in general, I think that the bigger studies are really telling us more likely what's actually correct, showed, showed no difference in complications. So doctor, with all due respect, um, the way I see it is I just don't want a complication. So I'm, getting the, I'm not getting the shorter course of radiation. I definitely choose the longer treatment. Okay. So let's see what the audience thought uh, about our question. Take the results of the poll. Okay, yes, once again, um, let's do you correctly identified C. So here's a case where our patient, Mrs. Abbott, had clearly been influenced by what her friend Justine, who is a healthcare professional, what her friend Justine had told her. And so when she's hearing about these two studies, when she's being asked to interpret in particular the portion that has to do with complications, it clearly has reaffirmed in her mind what her friend Justine had already told her. And it's very difficult, of course, to separate those two. So I'm curious, Ron, how do you deal with this when you encounter it in your practice? Right, so, uh, so the, like the metacognition approach can, again, sometimes be helpful. You have to first have the good first impression that Sarah shared with us before, and you've got to validate, as, as uh, Neha, you had talked about, their concerns and take them seriously, make them feel heard, but then you try and share with them how um, they may be, again, coming from a, from a prior bias. I think it's also, we, this particular bias is very common among ourselves as physicians. 
how often do we read an article and if we like the result, we believe it more, and when we don't like it, we find all the reasons why it's not good. Uh, I'll share with you a strategy that my mentor, the late Dr. Dick Peschel at Yale, taught me, although he didn't use these terms, this is what he was achieving with this. It has been a wonderful technique, and I would recommend you try it. When you have a paper that you want to read, first read the methods. Make a decision, does this answer the question? Is the, are these methods good enough to answer the question? And if you say yes, read on, but you have to then accept the results, whether you like them or not. If you decide the methods are inadequate, throw it away. It's just gonna bias you one way or the other, and it's not worthwhile. This is a form of metacognition, or an example of what I mean when I say metacognition, that can help us as clinicians uh, deal with uh, this potential conflict. Yeah, incredibly important points, and I think we often might see this amongst our colleagues at tumor boards and think you're observing that behavior, but we have to recognize that we ourselves also do it. So Ben and Sarah, from your perspectives as a caregiver and the patient in this scenario, what, what are your thoughts? Um, well, I wanted to say two things. One is that uh, patients really are animated by their fears, and we sort of skated above the surface by just using the term complications without trying to understand what the implications of that were. So I think that has to be probed. And the other thing is, you know, it was very refreshing, and we see this more and more to have patients who have read literature, but you can think back to your first journal club experience and all the blood that was on the floor when you tried to understand simple distinctions like statistical significance versus clinical meaningfulness. And as much as patients are gonna read these papers, I think it's our job to do our best to contextualize it for them. Absolutely. So patients have access to more data than ever before, um, but it's not just access to understanding. Uh, to, to, it's not just access to that data that they need. It's access to understanding of that data. Context is everything. Um, and as a trained cancer researcher, I understand the impact of evidence-based medicine. But it's important for us to also give space to what I call experience-based medicine, where patients rely on the stories and the experiences of other patients as again they're navigating next steps. Because at the end of the day, the patient's story, that's data with a soul. So it's really important that we um, recognize that and, and really incorporate it into how we interact with patients. Okay, let's move on to the last case. Um, so we'll start, of course, with our third and final ARS question. Um, we're asking you to tell us an example of conformity bias. Is it A, changing one's clinical opinion due to social pressure and or power dynamics? B, always conforming to standard of care recommendations, or C, refusing to conform to group's opinion based on pre-existing bias. Okay, so here we're gonna get a glimpse of biases that prevail uh, within we the clinicians. And to uh, exemplify that, we're going to let you be flies on the wall on a tumor board. So <laughs> let's listen in. Next prostate cancer case, Dr. Parker. Sure, yeah, so my patient, he's a 50-year-old, high-powered executive, newly diagnosed um, with metastatic prostate cancer. It's just an asymptomatic bone metastasis in his left femoral head. Has Medoc seen him? Yeah, he's actually already on hormone therapy. Great, next case. Well, actually, before we move on, I wanted to discuss radiation for him. Radiation? I thought you said he had metastatic disease. He does, but it's just that one single med, so I think we should offer him radiation to his prostate. Well, I don't. Why can't we just keep him on hormone therapy? Well, um, we think that for prostate radiation, with, based on the Stampede trial, there's actually a potential benefit. I don't think there's such a benefit. I don't think the Stampede trial really showed that. Well, the data, Martine, what do you think? The data do suggest that there's a survival benefit to local therapy. Well, I have to say, Paul, I agree. Um, and I certainly wouldn't give radiation in this case. And Dr. Parker, I would remind you that now the regional satellites, we all have to be on the same page to ensure a single standard of care. So no radiation in this case. Thanks, Martine. That's what I like. Dr. Parker, would you like to reconsider? Um, yeah, sure, sure. I think that makes sense. I understand what you're saying. And that's fine. We can just continue with the hormone therapy. Okay, so let's review uh, your answers to this one. If we can see that, please. And there you go, this is such a good group. Uh, <laughs> exactly right. Uh, conformity bias is effectively changing one's clinical opinion due to social pressure and or power dynamics. And we certainly had some power dynamics in this one. 
So, uh, Dr. Ennis, would you like to expand on that? Well, obviously, what we were trying to show is uh, a number of different power dynamic issues here. One is the urologist um, versus the radiation oncologist. One is the senior male physician, the younger female physician, um, and obviously the domineering type of uh, personality oozing with uh, antagonism and judgment. Um, and, and the point of the case isn't just that this happens and how to deal with it. That is one of the points. But the other point is that it can get to the point where the junior physician will actually believe that I'm right when I was wrong about the stampede data. I hope you know that. <laughs> I was wrong. Um, but I thought I was right. And I presented it with such confidence that a, a person can be convinced that they're wrong mm -hmm. when they're really right. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think there were so many complex issues there, right? There was, first of all, the dynamic of the number of individuals sort of directing comments to one person. There was the, you know, sort of hesitation on the part of the, the junior doctor. It wasn't just me being a bad actress, but also <laughs> me actually trying to feel a little bit uh, disconcerted and also maybe, you know, thrown off because I wasn't expecting the antagonism. Um, but I think when you're in this situation, and you're absolutely right, so there's the dynamic of the referring physician, there's the dynamic of um, deference to seniority, but also deference to experience, right? Well, I mean, you have clinical experience, and so there are times where you may have some uh, approach that isn't what the junior uh, physician thought was right. But I think in this case, we have to be really mindful that if there are data that you are aware of, um, that clearly would benefit your patient and the decisions that are being made are counter to those data. It is absolutely imperative on us as advocates for patients to share that in some way. And yes, it can be very challenging when this is the person that, you know, uh, is in charge of your promotion and of course can make your um, career uh, a positive or a negative uh, one. And, and you'd hate to sort of think that that would however, keep you from doing the right thing for the patient. So perhaps one way that that could have been handled in that scenario is rather than just acquiescing in that moment, even though they were feeling thrown, maybe they were wondering if they interpreted the data correctly, maybe they do have to go back. You might imagine a situation where you say, well, actually, you know what? Um, I told the patient I'd get back to him and I do wanna be able to review this trial. Maybe it would be helpful to the tumor board if I bring it back next week and we can actually go over the results and just do like a little mini session at the beginning if everyone's agreeable to that. And at least make that effort to perhaps not in that moment when you know that you're under these pressures and this bias to not give in until you're actually really uh, in a better place to make a decision. Okay, so uh, I wanna just summarize a little bit. If we could get um, my slide deck up, I just wanna show you a few things and make some uh, concluding comments. Okay, so there we go. Um, so effectively, um, uh, first of all, I wanna say that uh, I found this entire process to be very cool and a lot of fun, which are two adjectives that I don't usually associate with the ramp up to astro presentations. So um, that's amazing. We're here because of this really important editorial that was published last year in the Red Journal by Ennis and Vapuwala. And there's a so-called baker's dozen of 13 different cognitive biases that Kahneman and Tversky um, summarized. Many of them, they uh, did the research on themselves and that was the source of a Nobel Prize for Kahneman. Um, in the editorial, six different uh, phenomena are described. We used, through the brilliance of Dr. Sarah Hoffey, the script technique to amplify three of them today. And I just wanna make a few more comments on the conformity bias and maybe a behavioral economic suggestion about how we might deal with some of this. So I found case three, the third vignette, to uh, really be riveting. Um, I had a lot of apprehensions, uh, maybe you did too, um, and uh, I think there are reasons for that. Um, it was so realistic because first of all, you see yourself thrust into it as a physician, and it's not just the patient or the caregiver that has the biases, it's we the doctor. The discussion's completely opaque, uh, to the patient. The patient assumes we have their best interest at heart, and I think we do, but there's a unique dynamic to a tumor board, and sometimes it becomes very agenda-laden and filled with intrigue, and sometimes we end up selling our soul. For me, the most difficult part was this spectrum of seniority. I found myself toggling between the innocent um, and idealistic Dr. Parker um, versus sort of the older doc set uh, in his ways. 
Um, and the solutions really aren't simple because young Dr. Parker has the task of maybe changing a culture of a medical establishment or even trying to change the behavior of an individual. So um, Dr. Ennis alluded to this uh, phenomenon. This is the ASH paradigm. It's such a classic experiment. It's right there with a link on the homepage of Swarthmore College where Solomon Ash worked. And what happens is participants um, are given these two cards. They know uh, which line is which, and yet when confederates who are in cahoots with the experimenters come in and disrupt, they can be swayed in 35% of cases to think that uh, the incorrect answer is the correct answer. When Ash expanded this and used status, he brought in people from sororities and fraternities that were elitist on the campus, 45% of them changed their mind. And about 15 years ago at Emory University, Burns and colleagues repeated the experiment in an fMRI unit. And they found that among the people who changed their mind, there was actual increased activity in the visual cortex, both in the parietal and mostly in the occipital area. So visual perception has changed because of this phenomenon. In other words, we usually say that seeing is believing, and here it's more a case of believing is seeing. So, uh, you know, you saw this great uh, thespian work here. When I first got the script, I didn't know that Dr. Vapdawala would be playing the part of Dr. Parker, and I confess that I freely associated with another Dr. Parker, a comic book uh, alter ego. Now, he's, of course, a chemist, but he could have pivoted to radiation oncology like so many did um, during COVID. And it's important because we're sort of almost asked to have these heroic powers uh, in trying to deal and navigate with some of the things that we saw. So what is this behavioral economic uh, solution that we might consider? One solution we heard about was metacognition, which in essence is stepping outside yourself to understand yourself. I wanna look at something called the positivity bias, um, which essentially involves stepping inside yourself to see yourself. And here, behavioral economics use code to tell you there's a distinction between optimism and hope. They're not synonyms. Optimism is a trait. You see the glass half full. You see it half full with cherry soda. But in hope, there's a state. You can become more hopeful. And usually that's done through a workshop environment where you're taught to think about a goal that's meaningful to you, to think about the pathway to the goal, knowing there are obstacles like biases on the pathway, and you can think about how to circumvent them and you have to have the agency to step around uh, those biases and to move towards the goals. So the idea is that you get to know yourself, get to know your values through this workshop process, and therefore have a better chance of, res of keeping your resolve and moving towards the things that you believe are right. This is done with a hope map. It used to be a paper and pencil exercise where you think about the goals and the obstacles. During COVID, it moved to a, a virtual platform for people who are interested in this kind of thing. And this is some data uh, that's published in a digital health journal where we ran a virtual uh, HOPE workshop for SWOG investigators and using the two instruments to get a sense of whether these workshops are effective. We got very high scores. And subjectively, the participants said that this was exactly because they felt they knew themselves better through this workshop process and they were able to connect their values towards the goals so that in the condition of hopefulness, values and goals are aligned, whereas in a condition of bias, there's a disarray between values and goals. So my conclusions are that these biases lurk in the clinical interactions that we encounter daily, that patients as well as the healthcare professionals are vulnerable to these, that the biases can interfere with sound clinical decision-making. Hope theory might be valuable here because it's a pragmatic, not an abstract or romantic view of hope, but rather hope is a skill. And with these hope workshops, we can align values with goals and thereby decrease the likelihood of giving in to a bias, minimize downstream dissonance and decisional regret, and enable the individuals to express their true self. Now, hope theory does not purport to turn any one of us into a Spider-Man. However, if we internalize some of these very simple principles, then I think that Parker can possibly prevail as Parker. Thank you.